Welcome everybody to our webinar today. Uh, today we're going to we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, you know really how to become a successful CISO and we we've got a we've got a great uh, we've got a great guest today by the name of Robert Fink. So just a little bit about me and who I am and and then we'll do some introductions of Rob as well. So I'm the uh, Worldwide Managing Director for our Threat Zero practice and consulting arm of BlackBerry Silence. So vast experience with, from a security perspective, started out uh, as, as an admin and then, you know, got into the security field and then got into consulting and built a lot of services and security engineering practices for EI Digital Security and Beyond Trust. So lots of experience with not only vulnerability assessment, but privilege identity management and systems management, penetration testing, so really kind of run the gamut. Been here for about four years with Silence, where I ran and, and grew the, the Threat Zero team, just, you know, making, delighting our customers and helping uh, implement uh, Silence Protect and Optics pretty much around the globe. So that said, I, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Rob Fink. He's a star of our show today and just has some great insights for us. So, uh, Rob, let me let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Dave. I'm Rob Fink. I am principal consultant and virtual CISO for the Silence Strategic Services team. And in this role, I help organizations across the country either improve their existing security programs or, or help them to create new ones from scratch if necessary. Prior to coming to uh, Silence, I was the chief information security officer at Tulane University in New Orleans. Prior to that, I was senior cybersecurity engineer at the Department of Energy Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Prior to that, I was the deputy chief uh, information officer for the Louisiana National Guard. Uh, I'm happy to be here today, Dick. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. So, uh, you know, that said, I see from your bio, prior to coming to Silence, you were the, you know, obviously the deputy CIO and system security officer for a military organization with a fair amount of branches. Then you were basically heading up uh, uh, as a cybersecurity engineer, uh, the federal, you know, in some federal government agencies, and served as the ISO there for both uh, IT and OT environments. So a lot of ICS there, and then you became the CISO for a major research university. So if you don't mind me asking, with this vast career, how did you wind up here at Silence? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an interesting journey. Um... You know, prior to joining Silence, I was actually a Silence customer. If, if you think back to, to 2015, soon after the, the big Office of Personnel Management breach, where several of the federal government employees had all their security clearance information released or breached, our, our team at the Strategic Petroleum Reserve thought we, we probably needed to go through a similar type process um, to make sure that we hadn't been compromised, that something hadn't happened in our organization that we weren't aware of. Um, so we contracted Silence to come in and perform the same compromise assessment that they had performed at OPM to help us find out, you know, if there was something that we, we had not found. And, and luckily uh, for us, we, we did not, we had not been compromised. Um, and so we, we took that opportunity to install the Silence Protect client on all of our endpoints to go through the, the Threat Zero service to get us up to speed. Uh, very fast and put ourselves in a position that, that we wouldn't get compromised like OPM did. Fast forward to, to 2019, I had moved to Tulane University, had become the CISO there, and it was an amazing institution to be a part of. I was working with a really special group of leaders working to improve not only the security program, but the entire IT operations uh, for this institution, which included over 18,000 users spread across 10 separate undergraduate and graduate schools, 30 different administrative departments, and even 20 medical clinics. So it was a fascinating opportunity, fascinating place to work, and, and I was very fortunate to be there. Little did I know at that time, Silence was expanding their strategic services offering, and they had just kind of created this virtual CISO uh, offering. And so they were looking for actual CISOs to come in and help build the team and to build the program out. And so one day I, I get a call out of the blue from, from one of the consultants I had worked with previously, and he explained how my background and experience could help uh, organizations across the country, not just one organization, but, but, but many organizations. And the rest, as they say, is kind of history. 
Outstanding. So you had experience with not only the products, but also with some of our more popular services. Yes. Interesting. So, you know, really jumping into the, the, the meat of today's conversation, the discussion is really around the requirements and, and really the pressures that are put on new CISOs. So I imagine that in your career, there were many, you know, many lessons learned that, that can help someone who's just starting on this journey or just starting to walk that CISO path. So we're interested in learning how you dealt with some of these challenges that you faced and some of the lessons learned and what you could share with the new CISO and what they could do better to prepare themselves for basically the, the pressures and the demands of what's put on a CISO today. Sure. In my experience, the, the organizations vary significantly from, from one organization to the other. How the organizations utilize their CISO is vastly different from one, one organization to the other. It's been my experience in every organization that I was a part of that the CISOs fell under the chief information officer. And I, I think the main reason for that is, is that the role of the CISO is still not really well understood. So by default, you know, that seems like it's, it's the most logical fit. Right. So do you think the size of the organization or the maturity level of the organization is a factor in that kind of org chart placement? Sure. You know, I think, I think larger organizations have a better understanding of the requirements for all the C-level or vice president level positions uh, versus, say, a director or a manager uh, level position. Uh, and, and, you know, and frankly, they have deeper pockets to be able to afford those multiple layers. And so, Rob, in your opinion, do you think that's where it fits? Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of the opinion that, that the CISO should be at the same level of the CIO, you know, working as a peer, not as a subordinate. You know, you see that in some of the organizations where, where the CISOs are at that same level. And, and in those structures, maybe both of them report to the chief operating officer or the chief financial officer. Or, or maybe you'll see the CISO under a completely different chain of command actually working for, say, the, the chief security officer, somebody who does both physical and information security, or, or maybe in a completely different uh, side of the business under the chief risk officer. Um, either way, I, I kind of think that, that that CISO and that CIO should be at the same level as peers. Can you expand on that a little bit on the why you think they should be at that same level and some of those benefits? Uh, you know, I, th I think there's a natural struggle between operations and, and security. And, and in every day, risk-based decisions need to be made to strike that balance. It can be difficult for the CISO, who is a subordinate of the CIO, to truly be heard in an environment where innovation and speed of delivery is being weighed heavier than, than security by, by the CIO. Uh, I, you know, sometimes I use a football analogy for this on, on a team where whether the head coach was an offensive player or offensive coordinator, then you, you find these teams to be more focused on offense. And likewise, where the coach came up on the defensive side of the ball, those teams seem to be more defensive minded. So in my mind, I see uh, CIOs uh, more like those offensive minded coaches. You, you know, they're, they're focused on staying ahead of the competition uh, meeting the ever-changing requirements, speed of delivery, where your CISO, on the other hand, is more defensive-minded. You know, they're focused on protecting the company's lead by, by helping them understand, you know, where are the vulnerabilities, how to mitigate those, and how to prevent the adversaries from, from taking advantage of the organization. I think it's important that the CISO is in a place within the organization where their opinions and their concerns are being weighed appropriately. You know, one other observation I've made in these organizations where the CISOs are subordinate to the CIO, in this type of superior subordinate relationship, you're more likely going to see that CISO being primarily limited to just managing the day-to-day -day security operations with little, if any, access to the rest of the C-level staff. And so this is a diminished role for the CISO. And, and it's hard for them to effectively contribute at that strategic level of the organization. And that's just not really a good utilization of, of a resource like this. Right. I, I love the football analogy. So when you say this limits the CISO's ability to contribute at the strategic level, what, what do you mean by that? Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, the CISO should be participating 
in, in, in strategic level discussions uh, across the organization, the subordinate directors and managers should be there to assist them with the operational and, and tactical functions of the day-to-day -day operations. But the CISO should be at the table discussing issues like governance, risk, compliance. They should have input in the enterprise architecture, um, cyber insurance, you know, privacy, certainly privacy is becoming a, a bigger factor that, that CISOs need to pay attention to. And, and, and in an incident response, not, you know, not just from the, the technical perspective about how a technical incident response happens, but, but the organizational coordination aspect of an incident response. Um, that's, that's a key role for a CISO at that strategic level. If their role has been diminished to, to simply the day-to-day -day security operations function, then they're probably being left out of some of these higher level discussions or they find themselves at a disadvantage that they're, they're trying to address strategic level issues, but from a seemingly uh, lower level position. And, and again, it's just not a good setup. So uh, sounds like the voice of experience and, and again, not to, uh, not to dredge up too many battle scars, but I, I, uh, I assume that these were some of the challenges that you faced in your career. Sure. Yeah. Uh, certainly uh, early on in my security career, uh, when, when the security field was really new, not well understood, it was very difficult to, to be heard, especially when every organization was, was expanding their networks, rushing out to the internet, adding capabilities and bandwidth without much real understanding about security requirements, you know, building security in on the front end. Um, and then even after security became better understood, I still found myself having to constantly push that envelope to be heard by other decision makers outside of the, the CIO's organization. So Rob, you've, you've been in some pretty interesting organizations across your career. Um, I mean, military, federal government, petrochemical, ICS, which is a, re, you know, a really interesting one, and then obviously higher education and, and even a uh, you know, medical research university. Uh, I imagine you've seen the gamut of what the bad guys are doing out there. Uh, absolutely. You know, you name the category of bad guys out there and, and we dealt with them over the years from the average script kitty noise that you get 24 seven to, to more targeted types of attacks from, from hacktivists who, who just didn't like the line of business we were in to even the, the more dangerous uh, organized crime and nation state groups who had uh, very targeted agendas against the, uh, the organization that I was working with. Definitely. So scary stuff. Um, so let me ask you this. Were you always good at catching them? <laughs> no, sir. Certainly not on the front end of my career. Um, you know, I like to think over the years, I learned a lot. Uh, I got better at identifying the vulnerabilities, uh, understanding how the threat actors were, were, were taking advantage of those vulnerabilities. And, you know, and this enabled me to, to better articulate the risk to not only my, my operational teams that, that, that helped me fight the fires every day, but also to those, those key decision makers in the organizations who controlled the resources. Eventually, I think both my teams and I got better at it over time. And then, you know, now in my consulting role with Silence, I, I try to pass on that kind of knowledge to our clients who are, you know, maybe just starting their security journey so they don't have to go through the same hard lessons that, that I went to, through over time. <laughs> Outstanding. So, you know, jumping a little bit back into, you know, what what really a new CISO needs to do to prepare themselves for jumping into that role. Um, you know, what is it? What does a person need to do to prepare themselves to to enter into the CISO world? Um, you know, what, for, first thing I would say is make sure this is the type of role you really want. And what I mean by that is. You know, if you enjoy being that, that person on the front lines, you know, hands on keyboard, defender of the universe, then you may be sorely disappointed with the role of, you know, a senior executive who spends more time in meetings than in the data center. Um, in, in this role, you're probably going to be meeting more often with um, folks outside of the IT organization uh, than within. For example, you're going to be meetings with in meetings with internal auditors, uh, the privacy folks, general counsel, the risk managers, maybe the physical security team, 
and, and probably the board of directors. So, you know, at this level and in this role, you're more an agent of change, organizational change, uh, you know, not, not change in the, the technical sense that you may be already very good at, but, but real organizational and cultural change in order to drive security initiatives and security thinking across an entire organization. You know, think about it this way. At, at the CISO level, you're going to be more focused on managing outcomes than managing systems. And, and so assuming you understand that, um, you know, obviously you want to have a deep knowledge of, of IT security, security operations, uh, managing people, projects, uh, you should be a strong leader, you know, effective communicator. And you should, if, if you don't already have a good business background, um, a good understanding of business requirements and how, how they should drive IT requirements, then you need to probably go back, get a little training or updating to your, your, your career in this area. And, and, and so you have to make that jump between the, the, the tactical and the operational level thinking that, that you've, you've probably been doing as a, as a IT security person or IT operations person and now start thinking strategically. And so I tell people that the technical training got you to this point, but it, it's the business training that you need to, to then make this next step. Um, another piece of advice I would say is don't be the person who goes into a meeting and says something can't be done or, or something shouldn't be done. That's, that's not your role as a CISO. You should be trying to figure out a secure way that things can be done, secure ways to enable the business, not to, not to prevent business from, from happening. So in other words, don't be the no guy, be the secure way to yes guy. That has helped me tremendously in my career. I would say, Make sure you, you clearly can describe risk and, and relate risk to, to business requirements. You know, be able to talk in, in business terms, uh, not technical terms. Speaking in terms of risk uh, and, and being understood by other business leaders is, is absolutely crucial. And then one last thing I would say is, is um, learn how to defend your resources. Um, uh, defend, the, defend those resources by relating, you know, how your resources are there to, to address those risks or address those business requirements. Because if not, um, inevitably when the, when the budget acts comes around, you may not be in a position to maintain the, the footing that you already have or to adequately address the risks that, that are in front of you. Outstanding and, and great, great inputs there, Rob. And so, you know, one of the things that really jumps out to me is kind of speaking in the terms of risk. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, sure. So, you know, anybody can wrap their minds around risk if, if you kind of couch that discussion in terms of something that they understand, like, like personal investments. Let me give you an example. So, you know, if you're talking to a, a, an organizational decision maker about their risk appetite as it relates to their own personal investments, they can pretty easily tell you whether they prefer to be risky or risk adverse. And, and they can probably describe in, in very good detail the strategy they're following, how they measure success. And you'll probably find that, that you know, more, more times than not with professional people, they're willing to, to accept a good bit of risk you know, if they've got a good strategy and they've got a good understanding of how to measure that risk. So, so then I like to, you know, once I ask those questions, I, I kind of like to follow up uh, with a question asking about their risk appetite uh, as it pertains to uh, protecting the organization's intellectual property or, or sensitive financial or, or personal information. And they're quick to tell me that they're very risk averse in this area, but, uh, but they're, they're usually can't explain what's the strategy being used to manage that risk or any methods of measuring the performance of that strategy. And so this is where I like to, to kind of make the connection between the, the organization's existing vulnerabilities, the, the threats, the likelihood of explo exploitation. And then I ask them if they're, if they're comfortable with this level of exposure or if they think that we should do more to kind of further mitigate this risk. And that's that aha moment. That's, it's eye opening, it's ear opening, and then they kind of get it. And, and that method, that, that analogy has kind of helped me have good success 
and then justifying resources going forward. And one other thing I would say about risk, um, just as a CISO, I, I try to never put myself in a position to accept that risk on behalf of the company. You know, it's, it's my opinion that risk decisions should always be made by the business leaders, not the IT people. So it, it's the CISO's job to help them understand those risks, to make recommendations about how to address those risks. But, but don't be the person who's actually making that decision without, uh, you know, getting some overhead cover. Great. So, you know, one thing that really jumped out at me is, is you know, you, you mentioned defending your resources better than your peers. So what did you do differently than your peers or what, the, what, what did you do differently than what your peers are doing? You know, I put a lot of effort into linking all of my uh, budget lines to very specific business requirements or, or identified risk or even, you know, regulatory requirements. There was always that that uh, one for one linkage between th those requirements and the capability I had uh, for addressing them. And this included not only like tools or applications or, or services, but also the personnel, the personnel skill sets. And, and, and that also, you know, that helped me to not only justify the, the, the systems I was running, but also the headcount I needed, the salaries I needed to keep the, 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 the well-trained staff, the continuing training that I, that I needed for that staff. Um, in contrast, uh, many of my peers just had big pots of money for things like software or hardware or, uh, personnel. And, and those folks are always targets at those uh, draconian across the board budget cuts each year. You know, I, on the other hand, came loaded with my, my small line items, each with a very specific requirement tied to it. And this allowed me to simply pose questions like, uh, you know, during these budget meetings, like which of these business drivers or risk or regulatory requirements are no longer important? And, and you'll find that not many people in those budget meetings want to be the ones to answer that question. So more times than not, they would just move on to, to the next victim. And, and I would, I would, you know, be able to protect what I, what I had. I also kind of, um, I, I like to keep in my back pocket what I called my own budget elevator speech. And it was simply um, just to always have an identified unfunded requirement um, thought out in a couple of quick and easy bulleted comments. And so if, if an opportunity presented itself where um, somebody was unable to execute on their budget, I, I could easily explain that there was an unfunded requirement that, that needed, you know, I needed some more resources for, and I was pretty good at, at helping my peers spend their money on my projects. Rob, thank you, man. These are fantastic insights. So what are one of the biggest challenges that you see CISO struggling with today? Well, you know, I already mentioned that, that struggle at the strategic level and, and being heard at that level, but at the tactical and operational level, I'm still seeing CISO struggling with getting the basic cyber hygiene th things done well. And certainly mature organizations, experienced CISOs, they understand basic cyber hygiene. You know, knowing what's on your network and preventing those unauthorized devices and software from getting on, good change and configuration management, continuous vulnerability management, uh, identity and access control, especially when you're talking about privileged users, continuous monitoring of your, uh, of your systems, it, they get that. But be, because of time, or, or maybe just wanting to turn their attention to, to something more interesting, that, you know, the new hotness, it, it seems like over time they lose focus on getting those basic things done well or, or, or completely. Take, for example, something as simple as, as software updates. Now, you know, software updates are still hounding even some of the most advanced organizations and it boggles the mind. Many of the organizations are very comfortable with Windows updates, but they're still lagging when it comes to updating their third party applications, their, their Linux installs, uh, and their networking devices. And consequently, these are the things that end up biting them in the butt. You know, I think the criticalities of, of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing in those third party apps and in the network appliances are just as high, if not even higher than many of the Windows vulnerabilities. But again, for some reason, the Windows vulnerabilities usually get worked first. And I don't know if this is because of the ease of addressing you know, Windows updates 
the sheer volume that come out every month, the, the visibility of the Windows updates. But, but the, the organizations tend to work all of these first, whether critical or not, at the expense of some of the more critical ones uh, in, in the other applications and systems. I would say the criticality of the vulnerability mitigated, uh, or being mitigated over a period of time is a much more important metric that the CISO should be paying attention to, attention to, not just the sheer volume of vulnerabilities mitigated. And so if you're focused on volume, you know, just having big numbers to show the, the senior leadership, that then probably the, your Windows vulnerabilities are almost always going to get your preferential treatment and, and the harder ones to mitigate uh, are, are not. So to echo your football analogy, blocking and tackling, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So what else are CISOs struggling with? Uh, as, as I go from organization to organization, uh, incident response, uh, the preparation and, and execution always seems to be an area where the, the CISOs are struggling. Uh, we're seeing organizations that just have not been able to develop and implement a strategy that fully addresses being prepared for the next thing that's going to happen, detecting and containing those incidents in, in a timely manner or having an effective way to remediate the damage. And, and this, it, this seems to be a contributing factor in why ransomware uh, and data breaches continue to, to happen at an alarming rate. And what do you think the biggest speed bumps in that area are? You know, I see some CISOs that seem to think that incident response planning is solely a paperwork drill. And, and they believe that they have more important fires to, to put out. Uh, or, or they think that their staffs have it all figured out, and so there's no need to invest any more precious time in a formalized, documented process that inevitably is going to need regular revisions. And what you find in this latter case is that what the CISO thinks will happen in a response and what actually happens are two very different things. So you've looked at a lot of these. What are some of the elements that make one better than the other? Well, you know, I would echo what the, the guidance from, from NIST and SANS. They, you know, they advise that that preparation and prevention aspect of response planning, the most important phase. Um, and that's the place where you're, 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 you can do the most to prevent the incident from happening. You know, to that end, uh, developing and, and refining playbooks, checklists, uh, forms, anything that can make the process quicker, and easily repeatable by even the most ex inexperienced responders. Um, you know, there are a lot of orchestration tools on the market now that make this process a lot easier. But again, the organization has to spend the time to build these processes into those systems. And another item I think that lead to success is prior coordination with with not only the IT folks, but the, those individuals or groups or outside parties that have supporting roles in the process. Uh, this, this can also be critical for a rapid response. Um, unfortunately, what I see is most of the plans have been written by the IT guys, the security guys, and the plan never sees the light of day outside of that response team's organization. So the, the coordination and the supporting personnel are, are sometimes cart completely blindsided and, and unprepared for the roles that, that you need them to play. And, you know, and then the final thing I would say is regular testing of the plans to make sure that everybody's on the same sheet of music uh, and, and, and that the steps are well understood and they can be executed the same way every time with little, with little effort. Um, again, to, to use another football analogy, it, it's, it's one thing to have plays in a playbook that a team might review once a year. It's another thing altogether for teams to rehearse those plays on a recurring basis so that they can measure the effectiveness of the play, modify it if necessary, and, and just make sure that everybody understands every step and it's ingrained in their head and they, they can execute them quickly. So just to concrete that statement, Rob, uh, can you give us an example of one of these repeatable processes? Sure, you, you know, when I'm talking to organizations about a response, something like containing an incident, I always like to ask the question, if they have a well understood process or procedure or, or, or workflow to contain one compromised workstation on the network, 
Now that's a, it's a simplified question and, and you would expect it's gonna have a simple answer. Uh, if there is one, then this is usually a good place to kind of start this discussion about the, the other types of incidents. Are they just as well-defined and repeatable? It kind of helps them relate to the simple steps that need to be done regardless of the type of incident. If I get a blank stare or they're just not sure, then I try to ask like a follow-up series of questions that helps them understand what that process might look like. Do you tell the user to leave the workstation on or to turn it off? Do you, do you send someone to the, to the user's cubicle to physically disconnect it or is there an administrative process to, to administratively disconnect it or quarantine it? Uh, is this written down somewhere? Do you have to ask for permission to, to disable that user's device? Would the process be the same if it was the CEO's device? And the big question is, will that process work on a weekend or a holiday or if the primary decision maker is just unreachable you know, at the time that you need to ask it? If they're not at that level of maturity, then this kind of becomes the starting point for, for helping them think through the steps needed for all of their incidents. If they do have a grasp on at, at least something as simple as, as one compromised workstation, then, then I like to expand the questioning to say, what about if it were 10 or 20 or 50? Would the process be different then? Would it call for, for escalation or some other process or team to be called in? What if it's servers instead of workstations? What if it's an entire segment or, or building or, or even a remote site? And would you be able to, when you saw that spreading happen, would you be able to contain it quickly? These type of questions kind of help them map their, round, their, their minds around the current processes, how well they work, will they scale, can they, can they execute them quickly? And so uh, yeah, obviously this is a process issue, not a, not a technology issue. Certainly, like I said, there are tools out there that where, where technology can, can help, especially the newer automated response type tools but you've got, to, you've got to wrap your mind around your, your processes, solid business processes before you can use a tool to help you get to where you need to get. Preparation and rehearsal, it sounds like. Sure. So, you know, changing the subject just a little bit, uh, what types of challenges have you seen with CISO securing cloud environments versus physical environments? You know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of organizations that are just uh, bypassing their configuration management and, and change management procedures when they start building out into the cloud. And, and then once they're there, they're not enabling the, the necessary security controls that they should. So it seems a, a simple step. Why are they not enabling these necessary security controls? Well, you know, I think the infrastructure, the platform and infrastructure as a service marketplaces have, have been so simplified and consumerized that it's easy for an immature organization to rapidly expand into the cloud without doing the things necessary to properly protect those workloads. I mean, it's, it's so easy today for a server admin to get a, a free account on a cloud service and just start building servers. What I've seen is this experimentation usually leads to some sort of organizational experimentation or, or piloting and you know slowly but surely one or two production devices gets moved in for further testing and then lo and behold the, the organization has just inadvertently bypassed their configuration management or, or change management procedures and started building out production workloads without the proper scrutiny it's not that the change management or configuration management procedures uh, wouldn't have worked it's just that they kind of go down this slippery slope when they're testing and they like the speed and ease of provisioning in the cloud. And so that, that kind of becomes the, the new way of doing business. So Rob, in your opinion, are these cloud security controls as good as the old standby, if you will? You know, I think they can be. If you enable the right features and figure out how to integrate the monitoring of those features into your existing processes, then sure. You know, there can be compatibility issues and, and a learning curve when, when you start working with cloud-based security systems and certainly a resourcing issue when you start introducing new management interfaces instead of the, the tried and true single pane of glass that the admins were used to on-prem. And this can only get a, it be exacerbated if you're, if you're putting workloads in multiple clouds. I think it can be done. It, it just takes the will to do it. Outstanding. One may even challenge, you know, you're speaking about configuration and change management. Can one even do good config management and change management in, in cloud type environments? 
Sure, sure. You just have to adapt your current procedures to work in both environments. And, and like I said earlier, there are a number of good or- orchestration suites out there that can help automate not only the change control pieces, but the provisioning and deprovisioning processes across all of your cloud environments. You, you just have to spend the time to adapt your processes to those tools. And then if you don't have the, if you don't have the tools, then uh, you have to adapt your manual process to make them work in this new environment and then set up some sort of alerts inside of your cloud environment so that you can pay attention to what's going on there. Given the, the talk about cloud architecture and kind of platform as a service and these sort of things, my head goes immediately to DevOps. So this sounds like it could actually slow down or interfere with DevOps processes. I wouldn't call it uh, interference as much as I would call it baking in the same level of security that would be expected if you were building uh, those workloads on-prem. This kind of goes back to the struggles I mentioned earlier about you know, striking that balance between innovation and speed of delivery versus security. Right. So if I'm understanding correctly, CISOs need to get involved early in an organization's move into the infrastructure or platform as a service, right? Yeah, absolutely. So are there similar responsibilities with, like, let's say, a software as a service applications? Sure. Uh, you know, CISOs need, need to also be concerned there as well, uh, but in a different way. You, you know, in these environments, the vendors have much of the security controls already baked in. But the CISOs have to understand the shared security responsibilities for, for these environments. Gotcha. So can you explain a little bit um, by what you mean by shared security responsibilities? Well, you know, in, in all the cloud environments, whether it's infrastructure, platform, or, or even software, there, there's a dividing line between what, the, what security controls the vendor's responsible for and which one the, the customer's responsible for. The, these requirements differ for the three types of offerings, and, and the CISO has to understand the, where that dividing line is for the three environments. So I get what you're saying about shared responsibility for like platform and infrastructure environments uh, or infrastructure as a service environments, but what should the CISO specifically be looking for in a SaaS environment? To start with, you need to pay attention to the identity and access management around, first of all, who can get into the administrative console of the SaaS. And then I think you need to ensure that the operations team have enabled the most secure baseline configuration for that service, especially if they're going to be standard users who are allowed to interact with that service. And then I think you you have to figure out some sort of monitoring capability and regimen to to make sure that the controls that are in place are operating as expected and are being maintained. This comes back down to that access, doesn't it? So. Uh, interesting. So, you know, going forward, how do you see the role of the CISO changing as 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 time and technology progresses? Um, you, you know, I, I'm a little concerned about how we're going to handle all of the new regulatory requirements coming out of the states. Um, you know, the, the breach reporting requirements are already different from one state to another, and and now states are starting to to add their own privacy legislation following the the GDPR lead. So. Uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA, is, is the most widely discussed right now, but several other states are working on their own requirement. Obviously, this, this, this should be the responsibility of the privacy officer, but, but I think it's going to affect CISOs going forward as well, and especially in a small organization where you might not have a dedicated privacy officer. Right, so that's a new, uh, new position as well. So what are some of the other trends that your uh, trends or threats, if you will, that, that future CISOs need to prepare themselves for? Well, I'd say the skill shortage isn't going away anytime soon. CISOs are either going to have to find better ways to, to attract and, and, or develop internal talent and, and then retain them and continue to pursue managed security providers to fill critical roles where they can't find the talent. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier these, these automated detection and response systems. I think as they continue to improve, that's, that's one area where CISOs can, can maybe fill some gaps that they've had hard times filling before. You know, other than that, I think CISOs are going to continue to wrestle with the integration of non-traditional consumer-type devices being put on their corporate networks. Not only your, your digital assistants and, and off-the-shelf IP cameras, but 
things like wearable devices, drones, and, and maybe even autonomous vehicles. Right. You made a, you made a comment that, that really kind of hit home and that talent pool is, is really small and uh, especially, you know, at, at your level and at the CISO level that, you know, thins that pool out even more. So Rob, how can silence help new CISOs with these challenges? Well, obviously, we feel very strongly about our advanced malware and EDR products, uh, Silence Protect and Silence Optics. But we also have a whole host of uh, consulting services available that are beneficial for not only the new CISO, but established ones as well. Uh, you know, if, if pen testing is what you need, then, then we've got a red, ser- a red team service that can help organizations with these types of engagements. If you're, you're in an actual incident and you're kind of overwhelmed, uh, we have an incident containment and forensic team that can come in 24-7 to kind of help you respond and recover to any type of incident. I mentioned the Thread Zero service earlier. That's the integration piece uh, for Silence Protect and Silence Optics. And uh, we also have specialists uh, in the IoT and embedded systems area. Higher education, uh, I, I wish I had known about the education team back when I was at, at Tulane because these folks really understand the, the unique challenges associated with securing you know, both your standard university networks but, and also the, the high performance type systems that you see in research universities. And the whole environment, educational environment, it's a much more open and collaborative environment. And so it takes a special kind of knowledge about these environments. And that's really what our education teams focused on. If you're running SCADA or distributed control systems, we've got a whole uh, ICS team that can help in that area. And then finally, if you're just looking for that overall program development or improvement, that 30,000 foot level, that's where our strategic services team can come in and help with those requirements. That's the team that I'm on and we help doing like an entire program gap analysis, uh, help with your incident response program development or assessment of an existing program, all the way up to that full advisory function of the virtual chief information officer or, or VCSO. Very cool. So, you know, I, I think VCSO is, is kind of a new concept for a lot of folks. Can you expand on how that really works? Sure. In, in an organization where, where maybe no security program exists, our, our VCSOs are called in to help create programs from scratch. If the organization already has a program, then VCSOs are usually asked to help, help improve in one particular area or maybe with a couple of specific projects. And then in some organizations, the VCSO is asked to come in and actually fulfill the role of the organization's CISO. The, the beauty of Silence's VCSO service is that it's 100% customizable to the client's needs. Perfect. The VCSO, is that a part-time or a full-time sort of service? How does that work? It, it solely depends on what the client wants. The VCSO can be just a trusted advisor or available for phone calls now and then or, or serve as a part-time augmentee for a specific project or, like I said before, even in some cases actually be the full-time CISO for the organization. In either case, they can work remotely or on site. Again, it depends on what the clients want. Great, Rob. So th- thanks so much for this. Kind of at the time in the presentation, and you know, we're coming towards the top of the hour here, and, and really appreciate everyone who's is listened to this conversation. It's been really enlightening for me. So, Rob, thanks for that. We've got some good questions that are coming in. I want to make sure that we we address those because you know, Rob, you've got such a wealth of knowledge, and would really like to share those. So. You know, one of the first questions that we've got, which is a great question that I'm looking at now is, you know, can you talk about how CISOs compete for budget and resources to ensure that adequate and advanced strategic and logical plans in the domain of security and privacy are included in that corporate IT budget and that the required implementation projects are scheduled to improve the security, privacy, posture, effectiveness of the organization? So it's a big question, but it's it's definitely a good one. Yeah, you know, I I go back to that discussion I had about being able to address those requirements and and link them to very specific business requirements or or risk that the organization is facing. And and again, that that can be very difficult if the CISO is subordinate to the CIO and the CIO is the guy who's determining how that money is going to be spent. I've seen it kind of both ways. I've seen when they where they were peers. And the CIO would sometimes win the, the budget battle over the CISO. 
And then I've seen it the other way around where the CISO was subordinate to the CIO and still it was struggling to, to get his share of the budget uh, from the CIO. So you, you just have to, you have to be able to tie your requirements back to the business requirements, the risk, or, or any other re regulatory uh, requirement that currently unfunded or under resourced. Perfect. And another one from the uh, from the same users. How do you see CISO responsibilities changing and growing during the next five years? I, I think we addressed some of that, but any other additives to you know our conversation that we had, Rob? Yeah, you know, um, we have a, we have a graphic that we sometimes use that that talks about moving from manual processes to automated processes. Um, and and it, it kind of also talks about the, the speed of which uh, you can execute them and the cost. The, the more manual your, your processes are, the more expensive they are and the more apt to fail or just not be effective. Anything as we move forward, like I said, the, these automated detection and response tools are, are going to be hugely important going forward. The CISOs are going to have to kind of retool their stacks and figure out how to integrate more of those automated tools so that in the areas that they can't automate, then they can reshuffle their precious headcount to those areas. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Last question we had that came in from the Q&A is, do you recommend the use of CISB services for workloads in the cloud? Sure, sure. The cloud access security brokers, the, those CASBs, uh, are, are very important. Whether they're in line, they're, they're checking traffic going to and from your cloud environments, or it's just like an API connection into your existing cloud environment to, to check what's already there. I think that's, that's a tool that, that every CISO has to have in their quiver now as they're putting workloads uh, in the cloud or they're just storing documents in the cloud. I think that, that's, that's an area that you have to be in now. Outstanding. Okay, well, Rob, you know what? I really want to thank you for your time today. This has been, this has been a great chat, and, and uh, again, I, I feel more enlightened for it, and I'm hoping that, uh, that our audience members found it uh, beneficial as well. Again, thank you so much, Rob, for your time, and any closing comments from you? Uh, well, just thanks for having me, Dave. I, I hope I helped some folks out there, and certainly if they're interested in, in just talking some more uh, on how the BCSOs can help uh, their organizations, just simply place a call and, and we, can, we can have that conversation. Outstanding. Yeah. So, you know, kind of as, you know, a little bit of next steps, you know, obviously you can always reach out to us here at BlackBerry Silence about and to talk to, you know, guys like Rob a little more about the VC. So services, about any of our consulting services or products or anything like that, you can request a consultation, uh, you know, to engage a guy like Rob. Uh, and then obviously, you know, email us or call us. And this, this number is also our uh, emergency incident response number. So you can basically call that up if you have any sort of, uh, um, any sort of concerns or if you find yourself unfortunately in an incident. So, you know, right at the top of the hour here, again, Rob, thank you so much for the insights. Great, you know, great talk. Thanks for spending the time with us today. And most of all, thank you to uh, our attendees here. And, and again, uh, we uh, bid you a very good day. And uh, again, we hope you have a safe and uh, secure rest of your Security Awareness Month.